Hello, I'm Annabelle Brady-Smith, Communications Director of the Association of Investment Companies. Well, it's been quite a year with rising inflation and interest rates, as well as sadly wars in Ukraine and the Middle East. At the end of October, investment company discounts reached their, reached their widest level at month end since the financial crisis in 2008, creating challenges, but also providing attractive buying opportunities. By the end of November, following better than expected inflation data, discounts came in to 12.3%. Now, some investment company sectors have delivered strong performance this year, with private equity up 43%, technology and technology innovation up 38%, North America up 14%, and Europe up 12% in the 11 months to the end of November. But what's coming next? Is it a continuation of the better news we saw in November or back to doom and gloom? So to discuss the past year and the outlook for the year ahead, I'm delighted to be joined by James Hart. He's the Investment Director of Witten Investment Trust. Alex Wright, who's the Portfolio Manager of Fidelity Special Values. And Emily Fletcher, Co-Manager of BlackRock Frontiers. Right, on to the questions. Could you reflect on your performance in 2023? What went well and what went badly? And I'm going to kick off that question with James. Thank you, Annabelle. Gosh, 2023, big year. Very, uh, very such a changeable year. Uh, we went into 2023 unfashionably, unfashionably positive. Um, so we had gearing on the trust, um, which currently sits at about 14%, um, which was a real you know, kicker to returns. It, it, it enabled us to, to benefit from positive equity markets. We also bought back quite a lot of shares because, as you said, discounts across the sector widened, including our own. So, so that was positive for us. But really, you know, the key drivers of returns for Whitson have to be our, our investment portfolio that we outsource to our managers. So um, our core portfolio, which is primarily developed market equities, that was a that was a, generally a positive, particularly those managers that bought into technology and and AI companies. Yeah, those were real drivers for us. Um, on the negative side, some of the more specialist assets, particularly those that we own through investment companies, where discounts widened. Although I'm pleased to say that the NAV performance of most of those um, trusts were were were, were pretty stable. Um, so, so that's really the theme. Growth was good, value not so good. Um, until later, until right towards the end of the year, actually, although we're not quite there yet, um, the current environment seems to be favouring value. So, um, so, so again, you know, that, that's why we like having this balanced portfolio. Um, and what was really nice to see as well is our specialist managers focusing on the UK and on emerging markets, although those were two difficult markets. Sorry, those two markets had a difficult time. Our managers were able to outperform them. Thank you very much, James. Well, value being in favour, uh, let me ask the same question to Alex Wright. What went well? What didn't, Alex? For you, last this year? Yeah, it's been a it, it's been an unusual year because overall, the, the the benchmark in the UK sort of year to date isn't up very much, so sort of two or three percent, and the trust has performed pretty close to that sort of marginally um, below. Um, and when you look at sort of where that performance has come from, though, there's been a lot of movement underneath the surface. So a lot of volatility in stocks and indeed our best performing stock in terms of contribution is up 40 percent year to date um, and, and is also one of the top five positions, um, a company called DCC, um, which sort of sums up actually perfectly what we do. It's a, a sort of unusual company. It's a conglomerate. Those aren't very fashionable anymore. Um, Actually, nothing really has changed that much in this year. It's more perceptions around the company, I think, were overly negative through last year. Uh, particularly, you saw this on a lot of stocks towards the end of 2022. And so the valuation just got to very low levels and they continued to deliver this year. Uh, and it has resulted in a surprisingly strong absolute stock price performance mm -hmm. through the year. If you look at the, the downside, so what's been less good, um, it's mainly compared to the UK index that we we don't own oil, gas and coal. So that's been another strongly performing sector this year. The likes of BP, Shell, Glencore, big names in the UK index that we don't own. Um, 
and their their performance on a, a relative basis compared to the index not owning those has been a detractor. Uh, I do think returns have been quite good for those companies for for quite a while now. Uh, sort of, you've seen strong oil prices through 2022 um, uh, before 2023 as well. And again, that, that they've come off at the margin. So that's an area that we don't have a great deal of exposure to in, in large caps. Um, and we're happy to continue to um, keep that position. Um, but that has hurt us relative to the, the, the FTSE this year. Thanks so much for being so frank. So frank, Alex, that's really, really helpful. Emily, what's gone well for you and what hasn't gone so well? 2023 has been a great year for us. Um, and that's really because sort of the two components of how we do research have both really worked. The first one being sort of the country allocation that we do. And there we came into the year um, thinking that by the end of the year, we would expect rates to fall globally. We haven't quite reached that point, but we certainly have it emerging in frontier markets. And we've started to see many of our so carry countries um, really do well on the back of that. So we had strong performance from Indonesia, from Eastern Europe, from some of our uh, Chile, Colombia on the back of that. At the same time, actually, stock selection has been really strong this year. Um, and I think we've had nearly 10 companies up more than 50 percent in the portfolio this year. Um, so just one of those years where the extreme low valuations in frontier markets have been recognized in one or two places. And um, I'd really highlight that the Saudi mid cap space as a place where investors actually got really excited this year and really discovered some names that were just completely ignored beforehand. Valuations seem very substantial re ratings. So just pockets of that that we've been able to capture through the year. And, and on the negative side, I mean, part of the reasons why it's been a good year is because something hasn't blown up this year. In frontier markets, there's there's always something that's having a terrible year. Um, and 2023, touch wood, so far, you know, we've avoided it, um, which has definitely hasn't been the case in the past. So I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet but uh, at all. But, but this year has been a good year in terms of it being able to avoid some of the poor performing countries. That's great. Emily, I'm really glad you've avoided those uh, blow ups. So looking forward to 2024 and beyond, um, and we'll look on the negative side, first of all, what is your biggest cause for concern? I'm going to kick off this one with Alex. Yeah, I think the the, the biggest risk, um, which is still the same, I, if you'd have asked me sort of 12 months ago, is, is a potential for a US recession. Um, it, clearly, it was very well predicted that we would be in uh, there would be a recession in the US this year, this time last year, and that hasn't arrived. Um, but in many ways, it's a bit more dangerous now, and that because it was widely predicted, um, people were, were the sort of cyclical stocks were very cheap. Um, whereas because the recession hasn't arrived, there's increasing calls for a soft landing, which certainly could happen. But when you look at historic periods where interest rates have risen this fast and by this much, it's extremely rare for a recession not to occur. Um, and I think given the US weights in global GDP uh, and its um, linkages through the rest of the globe, that has to be the, the biggest risk for, for equities and assets in general for, for this year, a, a US recession. Thanks very much, Alex. Emily, what's your biggest cause for concern? Yeah, thank you, Annabelle. I mean, I, I agree with Alex, but actually, I actually also think that the opposite could be quite a big risk, which is that we don't see any slowdown at all in the US and the labour market remains very, very tight. And we actually return to inflation rising on the back of that very strong demand. Um, and we don't get rate cuts that people are starting to factor in. So I think that's also could be quite a risk, you know, especially for the smaller markets, which would keep the cost of capital very high for frontier countries. But I, I think I, could, of course, have to throw out there that, you know, big escalations in some of the global conflicts that we've seen this year wouldn't be my central case at all. But if we were to see that I, I, and it would really substantially escalate, I think that would be global risk as well. Thank you. So we've got a possibility of a recession and not having a recession being a concern. James, what do you think? Well, that's what I just love about financial markets, isn't it? You know, you've got uh, you've got two two experts with two equally valid views in in, in my view. Yeah, it is quite finely balanced. And so I'm going to throw in that the, probably one of the key risks will be a risk of a policy mistake, because it is quite finely balanced and central bankers around the world are going to have to tread this quite narrow path between trying to identify whether um, whether, whether their economies are growing sufficiently um, or, or whether inflation is, is a concern. So, so that would be that would be one. Um, although I'm not a big believer in politics feeding into um, financial markets, there are clearly risks of escalation um, in conflicts around the world. 
Um, and the other one for me is, is, a, is a big risk, is the US, the US election. You know, it would be absolutely wonderful if the US electorate could sit there at the beginning of next year and be confident that the two leading candidates might actually get to the polling day. Because at the moment, you know, there is a possibility that that both or either might be incapacitated, one through being locked up and the other one um, maybe not being fitted up to stand. So, you know, it'd be wonderful if the US could come up with some a couple of politicians who uh, who were viable in the long run. Okay, well, at least we've got politicians, I hope, that are viable in the long run here in the UK. But that's a, a fair risk for sure. Um, looking forward again... Uh, to 2024. Emily, what's your biggest cause for optimism? Yeah, thank you. So um, in our markets, there's a couple of areas where I think we're really optimistic. Um, I think if I was to kind of take the three regions of the world um, where we invest, I think in Southeast Asia, we're really optimistic about the manufacturing shift we're seeing out of China into some of these countries, their ability to start to take market share um, you would have to see a very small amount moved out of China for it to be very meaningful for the countries it's going into. So I, I think that's one area we're very optimistic. Um, I think if you come to South America, uh, we're quite optimistic that we will uh, continue to see sort of normalization of economic policy rates coming down. Um, we think that uh, mining continues to do quite well in some of these countries and more EVs, more lithium, quite positive on that region. Um, and I think if you, you come to the Middle East with just the continued recovery um, in the housing market um, in some of those countries, um, continued move um, to create a bigger financial centre there, um, I think it's really giving some of those countries a lot more uh, viability and global market share in financial services business than we would have expected. And I, I think that's very exciting for that region and moving business there, global business there as well. That sounds absolutely great. James, what are you optimistic about? I'm optimistic about everything, Annabelle. I'm always, you have to be optimistic. Ooh. You have to be optimistic as an equity investor, but you have to be realistic as well. So what are we most optimistic about? Well, um, not that our view is is anything to go by, but I'm, I hope that Alex and, um, uh, and Emily will be pleased to hear that uh, we're optimistic about valuations for equities, particularly in the UK and in emerging markets. Those are our sort of preferred um, regions short term, you know, there are a lot of great companies in the US, but valuations are, are a bit high. Um, we're very optimistic about discounts on investment companies. I think there's a tremendous investment opportunity there, particularly you know, some of those in our portfolio, um, but also more broadly. Um, I think there's a chance of growth surprises on the upside. Um, you know, one of the things that helped central bankers this year was that China didn't grow. Um, you know, it came out of lockdown. Um, and had it come out of lockdown, you know, out of the like a sprinter out of the blocks, then, you know, that could have really impacted inflation in 2023. So what we might see is economic growth attenuating or, or perhaps even uh, mild recession, but China coming through in 2024. So, yeah, that, that's a potential positive. Um, and finally, I'd, I'd really like to think that after a year of stagnation, we see a pickup in um, investment in uh, in the transition to uh, to a greener um greener uh economy because th there was some there was some stagnation in 2023 um and with re interest rates coming down in 2024 or beginning of 25 we should see a better environment for investing in the infrastructure around um efforts to to, to meet climate change one caveat us elections that could be a withdrawal from international affairs by president trump um and a reversal in um, the uh, efforts of the US to to make major uh, steps in climate change. Well, optimistic but realistic sounds like a good scenario to me. Um, I'm particularly pleased you're optimistic about those investment trust discounts and the opportunity they present. Alex, what are you optimistic about? So I think as a as a value investor, it probably comes as no surprise, but it's it's valuations again that that make me optimistic. The the fact that we're seeing uh, such a low valuation on the the FTSE all share about sort of ten and a half times earnings, uh, and also particularly on the trust more like about eight times earnings. It, if you look through the just over ten years that I've been on the trust, the the lowest we've ever got on that ratio is about seven and a half times, which was a, a couple of months ago. So we've moved up a little bit, but we're very low versus history. 
Uh, and then obviously with discounts in the space being wider, we're on about an 8% discount today. You, you actually, as the, the end investor, get, get in an even cheaper valuation because you can buy the portfolio at, at a discount. Um, whereas on average, we've traded on more like a, a 3% discount over my tenure. So uh, I guess a cheap market and even cheaper trust and then the trust available at a discount looks at, as, a, as a value investor, something that's that's really, really attractive. Uh, and so, yes, but there are definitely some risks on the macro and political front. But uh, I think the margin of safety that, that you get by investing in the, the UK and in, in special values is, is really, really interesting today. And it's that that, that gives me... Um, the, the biggest hope for optimism in terms of uh, the outcome in 2024. So it's a double whammy, a cheap market and a discount on the trust. Well, that sounds good. Um, moving on, James, after a year of rising inflation, interest rates rising, what do you think could happen next year? Well, as we uh, coined the term Table Mountain rather than the Matterhorn in our annual report that was released uh, before the Bank of England chose to to uh, to borrow that term, um, I mean that that's very much what we've been thinking about in terms of of interest rates. You know, we had a very steep rise. We're now on the plateau, and as Andrew um, uh, Bell uh, articulated very well, you know, it, the, the, that plateau doesn't need to be flat. So, in other words, we we do expect interest rates to um, to come down very gradually. Um, it's really important that with the inflation picture improving that central banks are able to focus on the imperative of trying to enable them and governments to, to boost growth because there's a lot of debt in the world. Um, and so economic growth is a, is a great medicine uh, medicine for that. I think central banks will be patient. They, they won't remove their 2% target, but they might be prepared to act. In other words, to gently reduce rates way before we hit that 2% target in an attempt to um, help deliver this soft landing. If we're right, then that could be a very attractive um, environment for equity investing, um, with the usual caveats, obviously, that you know things can change and you know mar markets don't necessarily uh, interpret the environment around them in the way that you expect them to. Um, and in addition to that, um, I would echo what uh, what what Alex was saying. You know, actually, I see a triple whammy, not a double whammy, um, because. In the investment company space, there are some very cheap assets that you can buy into through discounted investment trusts, and there's sometimes some gearing as well. So, you know, if we're right, and you know, with, with you know, we 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 you know, the, there has to be serious caveats on that when you're talking to people about um, the future. Um, if we're right, there, there there are likely to be some really interesting opportunities in equity markets and through the investment company space. Well, let's hope you're right, James. I have to say, I like the idea that we haven't got a flat tabletop now at the mountain. It's gently sloping down as we get some rate decreases coming in, uh, some cuts, which obviously would be beneficial for equity investors. Emily, what themes or countries are you particularly positive about next year? Actually, I wanted to mention a couple of countries that we're not yet positive on, but I think really that there's the real opportunity. There could be some great opportunities in some of these there's a number of countries that we haven't been invested in, we've been quite negative on uh, for a number of years. Um, and I think we could. there's a good chance we could see a turning point in 2024 in at least a couple of them. So Kenya, Nigeria, Pakistan, um, Egypt, Turkey, um, the Argentina. Um, these are seven countries, I think, six or seven countries, uh, where we um, have been fairly negative on the economic direction that these countries have been taken. Yeah. And um, if we see a change in that, and there's good reasons why we may, elections, change, um, negotiations with some development agencies, I think there could be some great opportunities in some of those um, through 2024. Lovely to hear about countries that you think are going to be coming into favour. That's really interesting. Um, Alex, your strategy is looking for unloved companies. Obviously, the UK has been an unloved market. What could bring it back into favour? I think that's probably the question I get asked the most uh, by um, by people who are thinking to to invest. But I sorry, think I'm bit, asking it again. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a bit like uh, as a sort of value contrarian manager. I, I always look at at stocks and, and think about sort of what could sort of the the catalyst be and and, and things to play out i think it's much harder on a market level like what will actually change the the mood um 
And and I think what is particularly interesting is that the, the UK market has already, particularly if you're investing in value, started outperforming over the last three years. So despite the fact that people aren't yet reinvesting and the flows have not turned positive, the market by itself has already turned. And so I just think quite possibly it's, you're not going to have that big light bulb moment that that makes people invest. You're just going to wake up and sort of the UK is going to have outperformed over three years, then it becomes four years, then it becomes five years. Uh, and, and suddenly if you've waited, you sort of missed a, a lot of the performance. So uh, it, it's in, what matters to me is, is the UK market under or outperforming? There obviously was a, a five-year period from 2015 to 2020 where we underperformed. And there was a clear reason, therefore, not to be invested. I think that's that's changing today. Um, what actually makes people wake up and change their investment allocation is much more difficult to, to say. I can understand that, but surely performance would be a driver, quite honestly. So hopefully we'll see that. Um, final question. We are coming up to the end of the year. So I want to ask you what you enjoyed most about managing your trust this year. What really made you get out of bed and think that was really great? Um, and I'm going to ask that question to Emily first. Sure. Thanks, Annabelle. Uh, I, I think markets are fascinating and I, I love the job that I do. Um, but I, I think if I was to have a second career, I'd now make a very good travel agent. And um, In 2024, um, January in Greece, uh, some delicious spring rolls in Vietnam and visiting the Red Sea in Saudi um, were, were definitely some highlights of 2023. I am completely envious, Emily. Lucky you. Um, Alex, what did you enjoy most about managing the trust this year? It's a it's a funny one because uh, I suppose it's if anything it's sort of the because everything I do is looking at companies there's a hundred individual companies everything is sort of stock specific and if anything it was this year was about missing the bombs so making sure you didn't pick the the companies where there was a as a huge issue because obviously when you have a portfolio of this many names and mid and small caps that tend to be more volatile the fund tends to pick up at, at least a couple of those where you've you've definitely got it wrong. Um, and actually, this year, we've had an unusually small number of those in a in a very tough environment. So it, it was enjoyable that actually, on average, our thesis came through more often on the fundamentals this year than, than maybe it's done in, in other years in what's been really quite a tough macro in a, in a lot of spaces. So it's it might not sound like an exciting thing not to have just had disasters, but actually for, for me as a value manager that buys cheap companies, uh, just missing those disasters is a, is a really big deal this year. Well done, Alex. Miss those bombs. And as Emily said, missing the blow-ups, quite honestly. Well done. And James, what did you enjoy most about this year? I, th I think people tend to forget that the investment business is a people business. You know, fundamentally, it's all down to... You know, a company isn't going to do well unless it's, you know, it's managed by good people. So for me, the most important thing is, is the people that we're surrounded by. We have a, we have a fabulous job in investment management, but, um, you know, I wake up every day and meet super intelligent, phenomenal fund managers who either run money for us or, um, or are looking to run money for us. So that, that's, that's one thing, but um, you know, I, I would really give a shout out to the Witten team. Um, we've got a fantastic board of directors, my colleagues. Um, I just love getting up and coming into work every day, um, particularly after a couple of years of COVID, you know, where you sat on the other side of the screen and it, it just wasn't quite the same. But fundamentally, for me, the most important thing is our shareholders. And, you know, we have a lot of private shareholders. And so what what really made it for me in 2023 was them coming back in droves to you know to the AGM to uh, investor shows like the one that the AIC hosted not, not that long ago or Master Investor and we we now do a lot of um, you know online things with private investors and so for me being able to communicate directly with them and learn from them as well um, is is really important and it just brings it home what we're all doing this for and that's so that individuals can have you know, a, a better retirement or a bigger house or whatever else it might be that their their goals are. Yeah, it's always great to talk to shareholders and learn from them and find out what they've been up to. I can really appreciate that. I'd like to thank our managers very much for joining us today. It's been great to look back at key moments from 2023 and I'm really looking forward to seeing what 2024 holds. 
But I'd like to emphasize that we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Investment is for the long term, and it's important to have a well-balanced portfolio. If you are in any doubt, you should talk to a financial advisor. All that remains is for me to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.